In this section, we're going to look at chemical bonding and molecular geometry. Um, this is extremely important for both general chemistry and organic chemistry. And many of the concepts that we're going to learn in this chapter and the next will come up a lot in Gen Chem 2 and organic chemistry. So it's really important to practice with these things. So a lot of the times we've talked about molecular formulas. And here's an example of a molecular formula, C60. This is an interesting molecule called Buckminster Fullerene because it only contains carbon. It doesn't contain any hydrogens. But when you look at the structure C60, it gives you no idea that this thing is shaped like a, so like a soccer ball. So C60 is 60 carbon atoms arranged as if there's a carbon atom at each of the intersections of a soccer ball like so. So this, in this uh, chapter, we're not going to look at things quite as complex as C60, but we are going to look at some of the introductory ways and look in which um, atoms and molecules, or atoms combined to form molecules, and how they exist in three-dimensional space. And specifically, what we're going to look at is what is called the Lewis structure. However, before we do that, we want to just uh, remind ourselves a little bit about ionic bonding. So in the first section of this chapter is about ionic bonding. And as you know, ionic bonding occurs between a metal and a nonmetal. And the metal, in this case sodium, gives its electron to this uh, nonmetal, in this case chlorine, to form sodium chloride, NaCl. NaCl, table salt, is this white crystalline powder. Chlorine is a yellow poisonous gas, and sodium is a metal that is um, soft enough to cut with a biter, butter knife and virtually catches on fire when it reacts with water. It's so reactive. So these two things are poisonous, if you will, and this is something that most people eat every day. And what is going on in ionic and an ionic compound, which we can recognize by the presence of a metal, um, is that sodium gives one electron to the chlorine. Sodium becomes positively charged, chlorine becomes chloride, which is negatively charged, and the positive ion and the negative ion are attracted to each other, and we end up on a macro scale with table salt. Now at a, a deeper level, at the molecular level, what you end up with is these lattices. And here the purple balls represent sodium, and the green balls represent chloride. And what you'll notice is that this sodium is completely surrounded by chlorides. It's got one behind it, above, left, right, below, and even in front of it, even though we can't see that lattice. And if we look at sodium, um, it's surrounded by chlorides. And if we look like chl at chloride, it's surrounded by sodiums. Well, why is this the case? This is the case because chloride is negatively charged. So it wants to be around as many positively charged things as possible. And um, sodium is positively charged, so it wants to be around all these negatively charged chlorides. And you form this lattice. And it turns out that if you want to separate these ions, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in, terms of, um, in this, in terms of something called lattice energy, um, it takes a massive amount of energy. Uh, the boiling point of salt is very, very high because it's a very stable arrangement of atoms in sodium chloride, which um, arises from the fact that you have positive ions next to and interacting with, attracted to, negative ions in this lattice. Note that this is different than the macro view of sodium chloride. This is what table salt looks like. But this is what the atoms, which you can't, of course, see inside of table salt. This is how they're arranged. It's also important to note that table salt has very different properties from what it's made out of, sodium and chlorine gas. As a reminder, for ionic compounds, and this slide comes right out of chapter 2, we can form them by crossing the charges. Remember, we can identify ionic compounds because they form between a metal and a nonmetal. And we can identify their structures by their charges. So magnesium is in 2A, so it forms ions that are 2 plus. Chloride is in 7A, so it forms uh, compounds that are minus. We cross the charges, we get MgCl2. Sodium is in 1A, so it's plus. Oxygen's in 6A, so it's 2 minus. We cross them, we get Na2O. Magnesium and oxygen, they're both 2. When they're both 2, they have a common denominator we cancel out, and we get MgO. In this case, aluminum and nitrogen, which are both three, we cross them out and we get ALM. These rules still apply. They will come up again in this uh, 
in this chapter for forming ionic compounds. The stable ionic compound has a neutral charge. It also contains a metal and a nonmetal or a polyatomic ion. So it's important to just remember the basic rules of ionic compounds. The new thing here is that these ionic compounds exist in crystal lattices where the positive ion is surrounded by the negative ion and the negative ion is surrounded by the positive ion. And as I mentioned a minute ago, in a, in a few sections later, we're going to look at lattice energy of ionic compounds to see how do they compare. So how does the melting point or the boiling point of sodium oxide compare to that of magnesium oxide? But next, we want to look a little bit about covalent compounds. And covalent compounds are between two or more nonmetals and involve the sharing of electrons.